Hi. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today and it is then posted to our archives page for you to watch at your convenience and i'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch so please do share um, with your friends family neighbors colleagues anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show uh, for anyone who's here who is not from Nebraska, um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So we are the state library here. So we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So we will have shows on Encompass Live that could be for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, uh, museums, archives, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is something libraries are doing. Um, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations for us about things that we're doing here at the commission, but we also have guest speakers that we bring on sometimes, and that's what we have with us today. Today from, um, at least here, as you can see, from the University of Nebraska, Omaha, um, we have, uh, Claire Delaney and Wendy Guerra and Lori Schwartz, who are all going to talk, they're all part of the um, UNO Libraries archives um, in special collections there. And they are going to talk about how they've done some uh, interesting things in their internship program over the last couple of years. So I will hand it over to you, ladies. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us here. Um, we're just going to get started actually first with our land acknowledgement. Um, so it's appropriate to acknowledge that UNO occupies the traditional treaty lands of the Omaha and Ote Missouri tribal nations whose sovereignty existed long before the state of Nebraska. We would also like to express our respect to the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, the Santee Sioux tribe of Nebraska, and over 170 other tribes represented within the Omaha area. Please take a moment to consider the legacies of more than 150 years of displacement, violence, settlement, and survival that brings us together here today. At the University of Nebraska, we respect and seek out inclusion of differences, realizing that we can learn from each other, and we look forward to building long-lasting relationships with the indigenous people of Nebraska. For more information about this, you can check out the UNL Native American Coalition website. Okay. Uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, so while our presentation ultimately focuses on our new internship practicum program, um, it was born out of the pandemic. Uh, the part where we were all working from home five days a week uh, in 2020 and then slowly transitioning back. Um, our experiences were likely similar to many of yours. Um, a rush of anticipation and preparation for working from home uh, the dawning realization of challenges ahead, uh, some fumbling and stress as projects stalled, uh, some wins as projects moved forward, um, and here we are. Uh, so once we were back on site, enough to interact more, uh, Wendy, Claire, and I sort of jumped into this internship program uh, project. We weren't charged with creating it. We just saw a need and started working on it because uh, we're fairly nimble here. Um, we had... Uh, we all had very casual conversations about the spontaneous nature of random interns and volunteers who uh, reached out to us for placement just before and during the pandemic. Uh, this random nature resulted in our workload doubling without knowing ahead of time uh, and sometimes more. And that really threw off our ability to plan and reach goals, as you might imagine. So this effort was born out of necessity uh, to fix these uh, unsustainable method of random students and workload issues while also trying to make a better experience for our students. So one of the overarching themes of this work was building an ethically conscious program. Over the last few years especially, there has been a lot of conversations around the topic of invisible uh, library and archives labor, student labor, and caring for those working with potentially harmful content. We wanted to integrate some of this thinking into our framework. 
Um, it's one of the reasons we are so clear that students have to be in a library or library adjacent program and receiving course credit when completing their internship since we cannot pay them. We also wanted to create a workspace where students had some agency in selecting the project areas and any secondary projects, which we'll talk about later. It's really important to us that students feel like their work matters and is visible within the department. Uh, these are just some of the areas we considered when creating this framework. So we're going to um, each share the last year and a half of intern experiences and projects in our areas of archival processing, digital initiatives, and outreach before moving on to discuss how we went about designing our internship program and its various elements. And then we'll share lessons we've learned during the two pilot phases before wrapping up with how we plan to move forward in 2022 and beyond. Okay, so I get to start with processing. So as the Hegel and Technical Services Archivist, I manage a team of staff and students in arranging and describing the U.S. Senator Chuck Hagel archives and have recently taken over management, uh, uh, arra managing arrangement and description for all the department's collections. Um, the nature of the Hagel archives, a collection of around a thousand cubic feet, um, across 15 distinct series or groups of records uh, has allowed me to assign processing projects from small to really large um, and simple to complex. Uh, lately, the rest of the department's collections have opened up more possibilities. So this variety of projects benefits student employees and interns of all experience and education levels uh, and with differing amounts of time to devote to processing, uh, which definitely comes into play here. During the virtual component of the pandemic, I supervised five students working on remote Hegel and other digital projects. I hired and trained two student employees virtually and supervised a practicum student in arranging and describing parts of the digital Omaha COVID-19 collection. So in the summer and fall of 2020, uh, two students left the department and I hired two new students, um, aware that remote work would require changes to our orientation and training process, because uh, typically we're very hands-on here. Previously, onboarding was done via a notebook, plus conversations with me, plus some required readings. So I converted the notebook to a PDF and I altered training activities to accommodate remote work, uh, saving some training uh, for when students transitioned to on-site, things that made sense, like orientations to our space and more hands-on training required to get into the nuts and bolts of, of arrangement and description work. Um, I met with each student over multiple Zoom sessions to review required readings, to provide a forest level view of the collections and to explain the very basics of arrangement uh, while focusing on description and our finding aids database archive space. Then I assigned them two digital projects so they could switch out tasks during the long hours they were spending at home uh, between both work and online classes. Um, I emailed every Thursday or Friday to gauge their progress and how they were doing in general, um, just with life. Uh, this did not always go smoothly as the students were juggling responsibilities and stress, uh, but it did keep them moving forward. Um, then I had a practicum student work on a digital collection, the Omaha COVID-19 collection, which I already mentioned. Um, they needed a virtual arrangement and description project for a graduate archives course. Um, the department has other digital collections, but the COVID-19 collection was at the right stage to accommodate the student's course requirements, and it only required a couple hours of prep by me to make it happen, um, which was key as there was little lead time. This means it was done on the fly and without the benefit of the start to finish structure of our new internship program, as we were still working out details at that point. So the student gained experience sorting individual files, creating a file structure and crafting folder titles and narrative description. Uh, I met with them on Zoom to orient them, to talk processes and challenges and to teach them archive space. Um, which was essential because that's where they were going to be doing a bulk of their work. Um, and this student also had health issues during that time because it's a reality. And so that required extra flexibility as well. Okay. Uh, we do have a question that just popped up here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I don't know if you were going to get into it or not. You mentioned the COVID-19 collection. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to get into what exactly that is or was, uh, <laughs> what that came from? 
You know, um, not really in the scope of this presentation, but yeah, it was basically something that Claire and I were tasked with at the start of the pandemic because we knew that someone needed to be collecting um, some mm -hmm. COVID-19 related material. Um, I think because we knew, you know, what happens when you don't diligently collect material for something like this. Um, we yeah. knew there'd be lots out there in the ether, right? But we wanted to make sure we were collecting um, okay things related and, to our university. Yeah, and as archivists by trade, that's the first thing I know that would come to all your minds. And yeah. other, those people <laughs> who are not in the business that we are would be like, oh yeah. Uh -huh. no, yeah. Gonna... yeah. <laughs> that was very like much our conversations, like just with our friends and family and the community. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea, you know. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. Every day. yes. Yeah. <laughs> great, thanks. All right. Uh, so I started working with my first practicum student in fall of 2020, and it kicked off a busy year of managing remote projects for interns. Each student experience provided the opportunity to learn and implement better methods, and I built off of each one. Uh, with my first student, I felt a little bit like I was making things up as I went along. And while I really did have a plan for their work and intentionally communicated over Zoom and email to form a connection not really possible by email only, I felt there was a lot of room for improvement with my method of delivering instructions for digital projects. My student was able to complete basic metadata entry into our digital asset management system, Islandora, but I feel like their experience with me was rather shallow. So by the spring of last year, I had a much better idea of the experience I wanted to offer students, while also ensuring that their work was beneficial to the goals of archives and special collections. When I took my second student working on an independent study in their MLIS program from LSU, I created a work plan and a schedule for the projects they would complete, the skills they would learn, and the software they would gain experience using during a set time frame. And while it took more work up front to design an approach that incorporated my on-site student employee scanning to create digital objects for the intern to work on remotely with trial versions of software, the outcome was significantly better than my first effort. The student was able to learn how to create mods records in Oxygen XML Editor, how to embed metadata in digital objects using a trial version of Adobe Suite. I provided instructions using Zoom, email, and detailed tutorials I made using Vidgrid. With my third student joining me remotely from the University of Washington iSchool, I felt comfortable expanding their work plan to include a small project and connection with Claire to help round out their short internship with me. I used the same instruction methods and software trials as I had with my former student, with one change being an increase to the student's level of responsibility and access in Islandora. And initially, this was a bit of a stretch, if not like more than a bit of a stretch for me, to entrust a student with greater access to our digital asset management system. But ultimately, it went great, and it was really awesome that it expanded the learning opportunity for the student. And joining us in late May of last year, my fourth intern was our first official uh, pilot effort. Um, this was a hybrid student from Mizzou, and they had a learning plan and schedule that included the main focus on digital initiatives, paired with some side projects with Lori and Claire, planned informational interviews with other library staff, a final presentation, and an exit interview. The hybrid nature of his work allowed him to work around his full-time job while gaining important hands-on experience with physical and digital collections, including processing, scanning, writing mods records, embedding metadata, and completing <laughs> research for an outreach project. Um, instruction incurred in person over email and via video demos. The communication with him was really quite extensive as we were hoping for a lot of feedback to help us you know, prepare and better improve for pilot phase number two. Uh, lastly, the fifth student I worked with was primarily Lori's intern for the second pilot. And with this student, I only had 15 hours of project time, and we will talk about that experience a little bit later on. So for my projects, um, outreach serves as one access point for researchers to work with archival material. It's important that students working with me understand that outreach ties directly into digital collections and processing, as it is a key facet of collection discoverability. Uh, this has and will continue to be a guiding principle for me as I work uh, forward in this. And one of the reasons I was so engaged with crafting this intern program was to build upon my own experience and proficiency in supervising students. I can create or implement small projects with some level of agility and short notice, but previously I didn't really have any experience being a supervisor. 
So the first practicum student uh, was something of a spontaneous addition to my workload. I was not supervising her directly, but in passing conversation, she expressed an interest in exhibit design and installation, which are two functions of my job. She started a side project with me for our monthly display cases. I met with the student to discuss how we would go about selecting materials, creating labels, and installing the display. Within this small project, it was important that the student gained experience in using the catalog and finding aids, searching the stacks, and engaging with primary source materials. Additionally, it was important that there was trust in the interaction, as the student was rather nervous. While we worked on this project over the course of a few days, the student opened up about her college experience, some frustrations in the program, and hopes for next steps. I appreciated her frankness and the trust she placed in me as we worked together, and I hope that if she has questions in the future, she will reach out. Uh, the image on the slide you're seeing is the case that she helped me curate. Uh, for my grant student, I was the only supervisor for this long-term and complex research and outreach pro project. The student had a little experience working with primary source material, but not a great deal of knowledge of working in an archives. I wanted him to feel like he was part of the department team, at least intellectually, as he was working remotely. But in an attempt to make the student feel welcomed, I pretty much overwhelmed him. Uh, I assured him that we were working along ethical and compassionate lines during COVID, that I wanted him to find personal value and interest in the work. I gave him way too much freedom in selecting where he started research. Uh, the student dove in way too quickly into materials and started drowning in specifics when he didn't have context. He produced piecemeal things that which I wasn't really sure how to explain were wrong or incomplete. Um, thankfully, we were able to correct course pretty quickly. He and I talked about the larger programmatic deliverables, and I showed him where his research would specifically influence and support this. Um, there have been other positive outcomes. He has he's asked me to serve as a reference for his grad school applications, and the work he's produced will help increase collection access and discoverability. So the benefits of our internship structure, even in these early stages, is evident by the work of my third student. Um, this pilot two student was supervised mainly by Lori, but had a side project in outreach with me and another with Wendy, as mentioned before. Um, before the student started, Lori shared the schedule and the number of hours that the student um, would have roughly with Wendy, myself, and Lori. Um, we mapped those hours out and the tasks we would have the student work on. This simple document provided structure, which invariably, uh, which was great when the student invariably came to my office and said that they were ready to start. So this student curated two flat case displays and created social media posts about the exhibit, uh, which was items in our collection to celebrate LGBTQ plus History Month in October, and posts about their work processing. I wanted this last set of posts in particular to combat the idea of invisible archival labor and invisible student labor. Um, and so the photo on the screen now is the student with the case that they curated. Since we've all talked about our initial projects, does anyone have any questions about what we've shared so far? Uh, let's see. Um, yes, if anybody has any questions, you can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I've got that open here on my computer, and I can grab any of your other questions you might have. Okay. Nothing came in um, since that first one. Great. Okay. Um, I can't see when you're typing, too, just so you all know when you're doing the questions. Unlike some things I can't tell, so I have to wait till you actually hit enter to see if something pops mm -hmm. in there. Um, yeah. Well, I can start on the next slide. Yeah, you're go welcome ahead. To interrupt. Okay. You're yeah, welcome I'll... to interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now time to talk about our internship program design. So uh, Claire and Wendy and I all had our own ideas and experiences about this as interns ourselves back in the day um, and later as supervisors. And we knew we wanted our design to include empathy <laughs> and be ethically informed. Um, as a grad student, uh, myself, I had one official internship, a practicum, and random other practical experiences. Um, my practicum was a whirlwind, 60 hours, teaming up with two classmates in this wild warehouse. Um, one supervisor checked in on us twice, and we barely knew what we were doing. Um, for my official three-hour credited internship, I interned at a state archives where I scanned photos and entered metadata, and the photos were really cool, uh, but it was not a well-rounded experience. Uh, I stayed in one room, there were no enrichment activities, and I didn't learn about the broader processes that my work was fitting into, save for a 20-minute um, 
tutorial for my supervisor about their digitization setup uh, after I pestered him. <laughs> um, this was 18 years ago, and I'm betting that uh, their internships are structured differently these days. Uh, but this is one reason why I was on board for bringing structure and well-roundedness to our internship design. Um, I've supervised about 15 interns as a professional, and most of them haven't been part of an official program. Um, but I suppose due to my earlier experience, um, I typically supply all sorts of value added components, uh, probably talking my interns heads off as I uh, give them loads of contextual information about their projects, our archives, uh, the, the profession in general. Um, so now with this program design, this whirlwind can be filtered uh, through a structure. Um, I completed my MLIS entirely online while I worked full time. And that situation required me to fit internship experiences around a very packed schedule and in a very specific geographic region. Um, at the time, remote internships were few and far between, I'd even say rare. Um, I would think that one benefit of the pandemic is that we've learned that some of our work can be accommodated to be performed remotely, especially a good bit of digital collections work. So I entered into this design planning stage with the idea that I specifically wanted to ensure opportunities for people who might not be able to relocate or work a typical eight to five schedule. I suspect that the library and archives field misses out on a fair bit of talent that we weren't able to encourage or give opportunity to simply because people can't make on-site internships happen for whatever reason. So with that in mind, I also felt really strongly about designing experiences that were beneficial to both the student and archives and special collections. It's easy to quickly get burnt out by adding additional projects onto our required working goals. So my experience has definitely influenced my desire to create a track or a main project that could be done remotely during hours that could accommodate the reality of distant student schedules. Hence my reliance on trial software programs, cloud storage, and our web-based digital asset management system. So the two internships I had as a student uh, during and directly after grad school were both great because they were extremely well-rounded and I felt like I was part of a department and not just a student grunt worker. Um, these internships were both relatively self-directed, uh, which was nice to have a little bit of freedom and agency that even within a broad structure. Um, for the one during grad school, I was charged with a theme and a rough outline of an exhibit, but I had the freedom to map the contours of the work. Similarly, for the post-grad internship, I selected a track, but the projects within that track were of my choosing. I learned a great deal from both internships, but as far as the deliverables were concerned, one was more successful than the other because I had a supervisor who was extremely engaged. My second internship, I did a lot of that daily work, um, but sometimes at the expense of those larger projects. Um, however, it was it's really important that the UNO internship be well-rounded and include kind of that glamorous project-based work, as well as the more possibly mundane but daily activities that are necessary to make an archives or special collections work like shelving. Um, those tasks were really important to me during my internships because it made me feel like I was part of the normal workforce and not just a special projects person. So when we actually sat down to design these program elements, we started out with a really complex track system with a primary track and a secondary track with optional side projects, depending on the number of hours the student was working. And it quickly became overly complicated with parsing out percentages of hours that could be worked, how students would indicate their track preferences during the application process, how we would let applicants know what tracks were available depending on the archivist's availability. It was a lot, it was too much. So we decided that uh, it would be better for students to pick one area of focus, in this case, digital collections, outreach, and processing. And then depending on the number of hours they work, they could incorporate side projects. So my best internship experience occurred within a formal program at a large historical society, starting with a competitive application process. This was good practice for the future. Uh, it was guided by a learning plan, supplemented by informational interviews, and evaluated by a final presentation with my intern cohort. So when Lori, Claire, and I started trying to figure out what elements we needed for our intern program, we each contributed several examples of programs that we admired. The elements in design were also influenced by our desire to create well-rounded experiences while understanding that students are only human, and so are we. Um. 
So for some elements of our internship design, our ideas shifted over time. Lots of conversations. Uh, for a learning plan, which would list objectives, learning objectives, and the projects they would complete with us, we spent a lot of time going back and forth on how vague versus specific we wanted the learning plan to be. For students that did not have a plan from their home institution and library program, um, for example, we had one intern whose program had a very basic learning plan. Um, another intern's learning objectives on their institution's learning plan were so broad uh, as to be useless for their purposes um, and ours. Um, so we wanted the learning plan to guide a student's work and ensure that the projects they worked on have tangible results that demonstrate a learned skill. Um, we also wanted to use required readings to prepare them for the internship uh, and to fill any gaps from our specific areas of expertise that a student may not have been exposed to in their formal classes. Um, this would help all interns start on a more level playing field and maybe even develop a learning peer relationship among our intern cohort when, where possible. Um, so Wendy and I had each, each selected readings um, to fit our two interns and our areas of expertise. Um, processing and digital projects, and then later compiled them into a listing um, that we could use in the future. Um, and so we've already, we are, we also selected some basic and more advanced readings that give an overview of the archival profession that we could assign um, based on an intern's educational level that we discovered through the application process. We also knew early on that we wanted to incorporate informational interviews to provide a more well-rounded experience beyond what we three can provide. We suggest interns talk to reference and instruction librarians, interlibrary loan specialists, catalogers, systems folks, etc. We require they prepare for the interviews by looking up the interviewee and crafting questions to make the interview meaning for both participants. Um, and to round out those required elements, we wanted our interns to give a final presentation and take part in an exit interview. The final presentation helps the student reflect on their work and understand their takeaways from the internship like what they can add to their resume, how the work accomplished their learning objectives, and what can be applied from their coursework, uh, to, excuse me, to their coursework or future employment. We also wanted the exit interview to be a meaningful tool for reflection. We wanted to provide feedback about their projects and offer insight for how these experiences can be applied to their careers. And of course, we also wanted to hear from them about what was meaningful, what did and didn't help them understand the project uh, we asked them to complete and so on. One element we decided to institute was a formal application process. The image on the left is our working document and the image on the right shows the final form that's available through our website. The application is intended to give students experience applying for jobs and to give us the information we need to select students to work with us. We simply can't take on every student that seeks an internship with our repository. I'm sure we've all experienced interns before who we realized once they were on board didn't quite have the intentionality that was needed for them to thrive and for us to see benefits from their time with us. Um, our application process is intended to help prevent or decrease the chances of that happening and to also reduce the likelihood that we'll have more interns at any one point than we can handle. Um, after launching the application, we did update it um, with information to reflect that applicants will be reviewed on a rolling basis until we hit our maximum or the deadline. And we spent a fair bit of time determining what to include in that application. It was important that students come to this internship or their internship with a sense of the work that they would be doing and how they'll play a role in the overall function of the department. Even if the internship is required by a library program, it was still important um, that they know that it was a time commitment and we wanted students to be aware of hours, timelines, and deadlines. Um, we hope that by sharing the website and application with library program chairs and directors, we can avoid any last minute shuffling. So we do have a question about the um, applicants themselves. So mm -hmm. I just, just wanted to clarify, are you, is this just for um, students in a library program or is, are your, are, is yours open to any student? So our our internship program is open to library students or students in what we consider library adjacent programs, um, history, public history degrees, anything that um, 
would have some reach in an archives or special collections we are happy to have an applicant from um, the the main thing is that they have to be in some library related program so that uh, they can receive credit because again we cannot pay them um, right. and it and it is open to anybody in any program not just UNO students not just our home institution okay thank you <laughs> Um, yeah, that was a good question. Um, so when uh, creating this application, uh, we tried very hard to set expectations about what we expected from the applicants. Um, this includes points about this being, you know, not paid and for credit mm -hmm. only and that UNO doesn't offer housing and that interns may have to undergo a background check um, as per campus policy. Mm -hmm. um, we also tried to be very clear about submitting the learning plan, the program requirements, or internship requirements that a student's program would require, their academic program, um, because, I mean, every academic program has different goals and expectations for their internship components, um, some very specific and others quite vague. Um, we tried to clearly indicate that whatever information about your program was available, uh, we would like to receive it. Um, one of the lengthier sections of the application is the description of elements of the internship and areas of focus which they could work in. Um, so we spent a lot of time on this part as we've already talked about. Um, we tried to map out rough time estimates and percentages of work so that prospective interns would have an idea of what their time with us would look like. Uh, we also tried to explain you know, the main project and the side projects in a way that was clear and not overwhelming. Um, orientation and readings, informational interviews, and the end of the um, internship presentation. Um, sorry, I lost my place as tends to happen sometimes in slides. Um, <laughs> our department, oh, in particular, I would say the informational interviews and the end of internship presentation. Um, uh, our department is on a different floor from the rest of the librarians, and so it's easy, I think, for students uh, at the very least to feel a little bit separated from the rest of the library. We feel a little bit separated sometimes, um, and so our hope is that students will interview librarians and employees outside of archives and special collections um, to understand how other departments here work and how our work is connected to them, because we all work very closely together. Um, the presentation, as Wendy will share, has real benefits for our students. Um, not only does this ask them to reflect and explain their work and how it can be integrated into their schooling, uh, but it gives them material to use for job interviews. And going back to the point about students understanding our expectations, we do require that students submit a CV and a cover letter. Uh, the CV will help us understand what relevant coursework the student has completed and the cover letter will force the student to think about this as a job and not just a thing that has to be done for school. Um, from previous experience of going over student application packets, it's fairly clear that most students don't know how to write a cover letter or a CV. Um, for me at least, one resume in particular stands out for being completely aspirational as opposed to showing what the student had accomplished. To try and help students, we included links for writing CVs and cover letters to the application. Um, which actually in our most recent round of student applicants uh, was very helpful as both of them mentioned that they used those links and modeled their, their application CV and cover letters on them and found uh, those resources very helpful. So we definitely appreciated that feedback. Um, and so this MOU or contract language where we ask students to confirm their understanding of the program allows us to have some expectation of the student's seriousness. We did originally have students upload documents directly through the Microsoft form, which is the application platform that we use. However, we realized that that wouldn't work for students outside of our home institution. So now we have directions of how to email the cover letter and the CV on the application, which is a great test to see if they can follow directions. <laughs> All right, so we're going to try and place a link for the URL to our internship program page in the chat. And while we try that, just wanted to double check and see if there were any questions that we could address. I've got the link here. Yep. All right. Good deal. There it goes. 
<clears throat> that should have in the chat gone out to everyone in the audience. Um, also, I'll just mention too while we're seeing. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead and any more questions, type into the question section. Um, also mention these slides will also be available afterwards um, with the recording. So when the recording is posted for this uh, sometime tomorrow, we'll also have a link to uh, the slide presentation. So if you're looking for anything and you know, want to look at that again, um, and we'll also this is this. Is this link also linked from somewhere in the slides, or should I include that separately? People access afterwards. It might depend on how we shared our slides. If we included the notes for accessibility, um, or I, I'm trying to remember how we shared our slides. I think I sent you the full PowerPoint, so they should be. Right. In. Yeah, I have the full. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then the, the link is in the our notes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Cool. All right. Perfect. Perfect. I make sure. Cool. Yeah, if there's no questions, we'll continue. But again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will answer those. All right, so the first pilot of our program was admittedly a little disorganized as we tried to navigate main projects, side projects, and I went on vacation, as people do. Um, I think it's important to remember that we're serving soon to be new professionals, but we also need to maintain some time away and that helps us keep at least a semblance of work-life balance. Uh, and on that note of work-life balance, it isn't just we, the supervisors, that need it. It is our students, too. Uh, there was significant flexibility for real-life timing in this internship. Uh, well, I stressed to my intern that I needed him to show up when scheduled and do the work he was assigned to do. I also understood that a full-time job and graduate classes could result in rescheduling and adjusting of plans sometimes. Um, in some of my internship experiences, I remember feeling like I couldn't possibly ask for a schedule adjustment, and I never wanted that to be an environment that I promoted. Uh, just as we need students to expect uh, or to respect us as people, we need who might need time away or sometimes just need to reschedule a plan, uh, we need to give them the same respect. The learning plan used for this first pilot was predominantly the one provided by the student's MLIS program. It was incredibly broad in order to be applicable to many situations and all students, and that's appropriate. Um, however, my student and I did end up going back and forth, trying to determine just what tasks and project work fit under which objectives. And I would say that some students, perhaps not all, um, but some, will need more specifics to understand how learning outcomes can benefit them and then translate into real world resume content. Um, so from this first pilot, I had something reinforced. Um, it is really hard to estimate processing times um, unless you are having students work on a very simple set of processing steps. And I assume you could say the same thing about a lot of different projects in the library and archives worlds. Um, even then, you know, every student wraps their brain around processing at a different rate. Um, and I can definitely say that with certainty after 17 years of teaching them how to do this work. Um, what made this first pilot intern experience challenging was estimating what someone with no processing experience could get trained on and accomplish in just 15 hours. <laughs> For the next side project I guide, I will pare down expectations so that the intern is more likely to see a final product from their efforts. Uh, I can usually find an hour or two of work to add on to the end if needed, but this way they walk away with a sense of accomplishment and vision for all the steps of processing. Uh, one of my main takeaways was to write things down. If I have a meeting with a student about a side project, I need to send an email repeating the project, sharing links, and giving timeframes. Um, pilot one student wasn't a student at UNO, so access to certain documents was tricky in the beginning. There were no problems with the project expectations or timeline for this student, but needing to send out multiple emails for document permissions made me realize it would just be better to have a project template to share. One of the most valuable pieces of feedback we received from this first pilot was how truly critical hands-on experience is to being successful in the job market. And we probably already know this, we've likely all lived those experiences of multiple internships to gain enough experience to pair with our formal education just to get our foot in the door. Uh, but despite knowing that, it was valuable to have it reinforced. From this first pilot intern, we heard that uh, this experience was the ideal culmination to my graduate experience. 
The largest gap in what I have to offer professionally was practical experience, which I received in droves here. This exit interview, the presentation, and the practicum as a whole are the best possible preparation I could ask for. So that was some really uh, excellent feedback to receive. Um, the experience was clearly critical for them. Um, they were hired at UNO Libraries a few months after their internship ended, and they attribute their success to having gained some practical experience in the field. Yes, we were all very excited about that um, for, him, for him, yeah. Um, so we uh, recently piloted our second intern through our program, um, and uh, they wrapped up their internship at the beginning of November. Uh, they arranged and described a collection in our Queer Omaha archives, described and housed artifacts from the Hegel archives, and completed several smaller side projects in outreach and digitization with Claire and Wendy. Uh, they spent about 30 hours with Claire on outreach projects and 15 hours with Wendy on digital initiatives. Um, their final presentation and exit interview went well. Um, as a supervisor, you never want to hear anyone su anything surprising in how an intern is describing the work they did and the challenges they encountered, which has happened to me before. Um, but this didn't happen here, thankfully. Um, what we learned was that the intern picked up some missing knowledge from the readings and found the structure of the program really helpful. Um, I learned early on uh, with this internship that internships with multiple main and side projects would benefit from more precise scheduling at the outset, um, you know, and or better communication between supervisors. So for an internship of 140 hours, which this was, they were scheduled for 15 um, hours each in outreach and digitization. And I had built out a schedule at the start with input from Claire and Wendy on how much time to spend each day on which projects. Um, I did not schedule times within uh, that day or send calendar invites. I don't know if that's necessary. Um, that takes a lot of time too. Um, that's mm -hmm. still up in the air. Um, however, I could have upped my communication to compensate for uh, what I call schedule squishiness. Um, they were scheduled for outreach work many days in a row. Um, and as the days added up, their time spent in outreach went over bit by bit until they had doubled their time in that area by the end. Um, but I felt the intern was reaping um, benefits from this time. And Claire wasn't complaining, but mainly because she didn't know it was happening. Um, so I didn't say anything. Um, and my intern was having a great time, honestly. Like, and they really loved going back and forth to all the projects. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to see that too, you know. So, however, my decision to not say anything um, hampered my planning for the intern's other projects. Um, so I should have checked in with Claire sooner to better gauge the remaining time and plan ahead accordingly. You know, sometimes you're just like full steam ahead and you kind of forget mm -hmm. to take those side, those, those stops along the way. Um, another thing that illustrated to us the importance of sticking to the learning plan, um, the intern felt uh, pressured mid-internship by their academic supervisor in their grad program to spend more time on digital initiatives than we had all agreed to at the beginning. Um, however, Wendy didn't have more time to give. Um, for the sustainability of our internship program, we were determined to stick to the plans where possible so that everyone's time can be respected, um, so that our schedules don't get warped, warped by external pressures. Um, I ended up coaching the intern on how they could explain to their supervisor that learning to process and learning the ins and outs of our online database, a database used by a lot of archives across the US, um, mm -hmm. were also valuable elements of archival work. So as Lori mentioned, our shared, our shared uh, student spent about double the time on outreach with me as was originally uh, anticipated in the schedule. Um, and after going over how and why that happened, I realized that social media took way longer than I and Lori anticipated, mainly because I assumed the student was following the hours allotted on their schedule, so I just didn't check in with them. Um, and that was something that I need to be mindful of in this next uh, iteration. Um, it will be good to compare the original calendar, the actual hours, and how we want to adjust that time frame for future interns. Uh, similar to the project follow-up template that I mentioned earlier, I need to make a social media template for students to follow. Uh, the intern that crafted various posts had great content, but the posts were far too long. They contained bullet points and links to photos in their personal Google Drive that I couldn't access when the time came to post. 
So my, again, my lesson here is to make templates. I don't mean anything prescriptive. It does not serve me or the interns if I end up ghostwriting the posts or the exhibits. Um, but providing clear expectations surrounding word and character count, finding a balance between educative text and context of the item, the number of images that should be uploaded, I think would be uh, really helpful to make things run more smoothly, as well as um, having shared folders that I create that students have to upload the items into will help tremendously with the posting time. So this second pilot intern was the shortest amount of time that I had worked with a student, and I dramatically overestimated how much content was reasonable to cover in a 15-hour side project. Um, while I was able to teach the intern everything from scanning through post-production to ingest into Island Dora, I felt it was a shallow experience for them, and it was one that put a lot of pressure on me in the days surrounding their work. It was what they had requested, uh, but I think that in the future I need to be more mindful of what is realistic. Um, so in the future, I will aim to provide a deeper experience in one or maybe two areas of digital projects, hoping that that will allow the students to actually gain familiarity with the process instead of briefly trying to cover everything I can with an intern and only really providing them with an awareness of the work that I do. So um, this always makes me laugh. So moving uh, forward, we are looking forward to welcoming our first two non-pilot practicum students for spring semester. Um, they're starting this week, in fact. One started yesterday and one uh, starts tomorrow. Um, these students are from UNO's undergraduate library program. Um, we found that our application process worked as we hoped, so yay. Uh, they followed directions, submitted their application materials on time, um, and told me they used the resources we provided to work on their cover letters and resumes. Um, uh, so that was lovely. Um, I also met with each of them after they submitted their application materials, um, which I found really helpful to discuss the elements of the practicum in person, even though they could you know, read them on the website, um, and to fill in that learning plan we talked about. Um, and in this case, their program didn't have a learning plan, um, and so we used the one that we developed in-house. I found those meetings to be really helpful um, in setting expectations um, and even building uh, some excitement for their practicum experience because I love supervising interns and practicum students and I want them to get that same joy out of it. Um, so internal communication is going to be key to the success of this program. The point we made earlier about the outreach hours creep is a good reminder that this program can only function if we three are communicative, honest, and receptive to scheduling. The empathy and respect that we want uh, our students to experience must extend to the three of us as well. Uh, previously, we didn't want to advertise that we offered internships because of the ethical issues surrounding unpaid student labor. And that moving forward, I can't say that we'll explicitly advertise, but the information is publicly available now on our website. I'll continue to connect with advisors at various schools. Um, connections have already been made at UW-Madison, UW-Milwaukee, and LSU and also the University of Washington I School, which may be an option in the future if we wish to become one of their designated programs. So we hope that by intentionally designing an internship program grounded in ethical behavior and empathy, we can successfully attract students who wish to gain practical experiences while contributing to mutually beneficial projects in the UNO archives and special collections. Thanks so much for attending. If there's any more questions, we are happy to answer those. Yes, of course. Um, great, thank you so much. That um, If anybody does have any questions, anything you wanna ask, we still have at least about 10 minutes left in our official hour this morning. Um, so please do type in your questions in the question section. Um, anything you wanted to know more about, anything you um, were hoping would have been mentioned that they didn't mention yet, we can always expand on anything. Um, so thank you, Wendy, Claire, and Lori. This was great. I, um, as as you're going through everything that you did, I was, um, you know, this is very specific to your situation at your your library and in the archives and things you had to do there. But um, I thought it was great how a lot of it could apply to any internship program that anyone may be doing, that there's certain things that you do need to be paying attention to. And, um, you know, being aware of what this, what your interns are doing and really, you know, supervising and monitoring them, and especially if you're new to this, um, new to being a supervisor, 
uh, as I think it was Claire, were you the one that said mm -hmm. you had never yeah. before? Yeah, <laughs> that there's so many things that you just don't think about that you don't, you know. So I, I hope that uh, people outside of university archives will um, watch this session and learn and get some good tips and things for um, doing internships. Uh, we um, just recently awarded inter internship grants we provide here at the Library Commission to public libraries to help them um, bring in. The idea is also to bring, um, get people interested in becoming librarians at some point. And if you come and work at the library, you'll see how awesome it is. <laughs> um, and so I'm hoping, I'm gonna definitely refer them to uh, this session just to get some more you know, tips and tricks and ideas. Um, yes, yeah, so much is like organizational. Uh, oh, and, yes. You know, ahead, just trying to get things set up ahead of time and then making changes. <laughs> And we, we provide them with resources for that, and you know, su suggested, you know, examples of, you know, uh, a j schedule of what they could do and, and ideas. But you know, everything has to be specific to your situation. Um, let's see, we do have a question here, and it's something long here, so I'm going to read through this. See, um, what they do during the Okay, um, so here's a question from Amy. Uh, can you share some of the strategies you have used with interns who are uncertain about what they could do during their internship? For example, they just don't know what an informational interview is or what kind of work they could be doing in an archives or library. This may be during the application process or during the actual internship. So some strategies you've used to, for interns who are uncertain about what they could do. Like they come in, they just apply, and they're just like, I'm not sure why I'm here, but I'm here. <laughs> Maybe that's the situation. We've, we've definitely had that. Um, please jump in, Claire and Wendy. But um, um, in fact, one of our practicum students wasn't quite sure uh, between um, two of the areas what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, I actually met with them um, even before they submitted their application materials. They just wanted to um, ask some questions after they'd read through the website. And so I chatted with them about, you know, the different areas of archival work, and then practically speaking, what the areas were that we could actually work with them in this semester. Just, the, you know, going back to that, we have to keep it sustainable for a, for both us and for, for them. So, um, mm -hmm. and so after talking with him back and forth, he realized, oh, I, you know, I think really I would love collection management and processing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that that does take time <laughs> to to talk through that with them. Um, but that that was a, that worked. That was really helpful. Um, and then, you know, as far as what you know, what's an exit interview, what's an informational interview, that kind of thing. We also talked over that um, mm -hmm. as well because they had read the, the website, but I wanted to give them a good idea before they applied because it seemed like they really craved that knowledge. So we talked through all that. And that reminds me that that was, um, that was some feedback that we had received about like, oh, like a person, a student may not know what processing is. They might not know what digital initiatives it is. A lot of people don't. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one thing that we had discussed updating on the website just for like just providing some resources. Um, or a short description. Um, we have yet to make that change, but it's a good reminder. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we were talking like, well, I could, uh, one thing I could do is link to the, you know, um, SAA's uh, Society of American Archivists Dictionary of Terminology. I'm like, um, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, that's still up for discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're, you're, you're getting, your interns are these, you know, they're in library school and maybe new to it too have never worked in any sort of library before if this is they're just getting started with their education for their career they are maybe feeling around a little floundering even and just wondering so i want to do libraries but where what and yeah this is something librarians we work we deal with even with dealing with our users too and our patrons of using our own terminology and assuming they know we kind of would assume someone in library school would know but they may be brand new just as you know to it and we just don't realize yeah yeah i during my initial meeting with this one student you know i asked them if they knew what some very basic sort of overarching principles in archives were and they you know vaguely remembered them from an intro class an intro library class um and so you know i was like aha so i wrote down that you know one of their readings uh, that i assigned at the beginning of the practicum needed to be a chapter that I had that focused on those exact principles. Mm -hmm. 
and they really appreciated i think yeah. that sort of immediate um offer yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so there's another question here uh you mentioned looking at um what the information that these um, interns got from their schools about what their internship should include that some of them are good information some were useless or not so well as for what they you know needed to be doing uh do do you ever have any direct connect contact with the universities about what they are putting in their intern you know saying to their students this is what you need to do um as an internship like do you get to talk to the people at in the UNO well you're in UNO maybe the UNO program or even to other ones saying we will offer internships but we need to work to, with you so do you have any communication with these universities or is it just you're each doing your own thing and hopefully it matches up um I will say that if the student that came from Miss U they the, the communication between me and uh what would they be called? Be the coordinator? Maybe that would be. It was fairly minimal. Um, it, it was, you know, it, it definitely served a purpose for both of us and the student was able to be successful. Um, but, and I'm even comparing it to now, like my communications with like um, a professor at LSU, it was, they have the goals for their program and I'm not going to, I'm not going to come in and impose and say like, hey, uh, this is missing from your program. Um, it was more of just like a recognizing maybe what could be more beneficial or like really, you know, taking into consideration that like, yes, these really broad concepts are appropriate and um, for like most students, you know, they're trying to meet a lot of needs, but for some students, they really need help understanding like, how does this task that I'm doing fit into this much broader concept and how does that then translate to something I can put on my resume and talk about in a potential job interview. Sure. Um, so well, the conversation, it's, you know, conversation with students, not so much, I guess, for on, like from me anyways, I, I would, don't think that I would feel comfortable talking to a program and saying like, hey, I really feel like this is missing from your internship program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is interesting is wondering if from their side would, I mean, yeah, you're right. They have their own goals of what they want their students to know, and that's what's in their pro their plan. And hopefully, there's something out there that will fill those goals. Yeah. Yeah. And as we go, we'll develop, I think, more and more of these relationships mm -hmm. with various academic programs. So. Sure. Yeah. Once they see you, know, you've done this, and like you said, you had a successful one. The whole point of it, getting more people in the field, hiring, yeah. doing mm -hmm. the jobs. Yeah. Um, so before, so I have a question, before you did this, I can't, I wasn't sure, did you have an internship program before what you did? You actually talked about pilot program, or is this the very first time you all have done this? We didn't have a program, but we still took interns and practicum okay. students. It was just random mm. and not coordinated. Um, okay. But we were always bouncing ideas off of each other. So mm -hmm. we realized by combining forces, uh, we could mm -hmm. make it better for both both sides sure and now it's a much more organized yeah probably a lot easier to <laughs> yeah, plan for so. and yeah. incorporate yeah into like okay we're looking ahead in the spring semester like you know um, so I, I wasn't able to take an intern this semester that was good to know and like have that you know I have everyone be aware of that mm -hmm. um, yeah. before someone showed up on our doorstep <laughs> demanding digital collections yeah yeah Sustainability was key. That word, along with well-roundedness, kept coming up over and over again. We want it to be sustainable for us. <laughs> it has to be, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And less stressful, too. I'm sure that if you have this plan that you can refer to, rather than, oh, let's figure it out off, you know, by the seat of our pants when someone comes, like you said, when he's knocking on the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We want to help students because that's just in our nature, you know, as librarians. Mm -hmm. um, but there's that finding of the finding balance is important. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just seeing. All right. Well, it just hit 11 o'clock by my clock here. Uh, does anybody else have any last minute desperate questions you want to ask? um of claire wendy or Lori, we you do have their contact information there of course too their email so you're welcome to email them afterwards if you think of anything 
but I don't see. Don't see anything coming in right now? I think that's okay. I think we can um, wrap up for this morning then. Thank you everybody for being here this morning. Thank you, Lori and Wendy and Claire. This is great information. As I said, I think it's gonna be um, very useful to a lot of people and I'm gonna be, once I get the recording up, pushing it out to our internship pro grants that we just awarded here to our libraries to see if they wanna get some tips and tricks on how to do their, run their programs. Sounds All great, right. thank you. Thank you for hosting. I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen to do my wrap up here. There we are. All right. This is the session page for today's show. Um, and I did, here's the link that was sent in um, the chat. I will um, actually add this to the session description. I think I'll just link off of there so people have a quick access to it as well. Mm -hmm. The internship program page on the UNO website. Um, this is our main Encompass Live page. If you use your search engine of choice and just type in Encompass Live, we are the only thing out there called that. Uh, nobody else is allowed to use that name. <laughs> um, there are upcoming shows at our archives. As I said, I was going to show you here are right here. There's a link to our archive shows. Uh, the most recent one at the top will be at the top of the page. So today's will be here. Should be done by the, at the very latest, the end of the day tomorrow. Um, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with, with um, me. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when your recording is available. There'll be a link to the um, recording. We use the um, Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel for that and a link to the slides. Um, we also post out onto our various uh, social media places. Uh, while we're here in the archives, I'll also show you, you can search our show archives for see if there's been a topic on, um, done a show on a topic that might be of interest to you. Um, you can search, search the whole archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something very current. Um, and that is because this is our full archives and I'm not gonna scroll all the way down, but um, this goes back to um, when Encompass Life premiered in January, 2009. So we've got, what, 10, 11, 12 years worth of shows on here. Uh, so just do pay attention if you are watching an old show to the original broadcast date. Everything has a date on it, letting you know when it was first done. Uh, some of our shows, the topics will stand the test of time and still be good and useful, but some things will become old and outdated. Information may be, um, have changed drastically. Links might not work anymore. Some websites and things might not even exist anymore. Um, but and we're here talking about archives. This is something we do. We, as long as we have a place to host our shows and keep them up there, we will keep them all available just in case anyone does want to watch any of our shows going back to the very beginning. Um, as I said, we do have a Facebook page, um, let's talk about social media, for Encompass Live. If you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We do reminders. Here's a reminder to log in today's show, info about our speakers, when our recordings are available. Um, we post all on here. Um, we also post onto our Twitter accounts and uh, Instagram using, um, we have a hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation for the show. So you can look for that out there as well. Um, our um, next show will be, I've got, so I'm going to be filling in some more March dates. I'm in conversations with people getting some uh, descriptions nailed down. So keep an eye on our schedule here. But next week, I hope you join us. And our topic is United for Libraries, moving to a bigger, better platform. United for Libraries is a section, division of NL, ALA for um, library trustees, advocates, friends, and foundations. And um, since ALA has a new learning management system for all of their training and educational things, United for Libraries will be using that as well. And Beth Nowlinski, who's executive director at United for Libraries, will be with us next week to talk about um, the changes coming. So please do sign up for that and any of our other future shows we have here on the schedule. So thank you everyone for being with us today. Thank you again, Claire and Wendy and Lori. This is an awesome session. I am I'm so glad we were able to get you on the show. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see some of you with us on a future uh, future episode of Encouple Live. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.